I'm Mark Golub. Welcome to a live edition of In the News, where much attention is being paid today to the United Nations, where very shortly the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, will be addressing the General Assembly. We'll have that address for you live when the Prime Minister takes the podium. In fact, Sloan, let me see what's going on at the UN right now. Right now at the UN, I believe the permanent ambassador to Denmark, and Ambassador Peterson, is speaking. There he is. And he is scheduled to be the last speaker before the Prime Minister. So we're hoping that when Ambassador Peterson concludes his remarks, we will have the remarks of Prime Minister Netanyahu for you live right here on Shalom TV. I also have the pleasure of sitting with an esteemed group of commentators who will be sharing their analysis of the Prime Minister's remarks as well as giving their opinion on some of the other critical issues of the day. I want to introduce them to you, though, if you're a frequent viewer of Shalom TV, you know them very, very well. First to my right is Micah Halpern. Micah is a columnist whom you can read online at The Micah Report. He's the author of the best-selling Thugs, which chronicles the actions, misdeeds of some of the world's most heinous despots. We also have with us dear friend Shai Franklin, formerly the managing editor of Middle East Insight, currently a senior fellow for United Nations Affairs at the Institute on Religion and Public Policy. And shortly we'll also be joined by Eric Yaffe, who is caught in traffic and will be joining this table in just a few moments. We have also individuals on the phone that we'll be speaking to, and we want to hear from you. Today this is a live program, and you can join the conversation by calling 201-242-1142. 201-242-1142. So at any time you want, now, later, whenever, if you're interested in speaking with me, with Micah, with Shai, later on with Eric, and anybody else, we'd love to have your phone calls. But right now, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. We're waiting for the Prime Minister to speak. Micah, what do you expect him to say? Well, I would say immediately. He's going to talk about how important the, um, the world needs to be together and united against an Iranian potential threat. So as charming and as exciting as the week has been up until now, where Iran took center stage as being a warm, cuddly character, and Rouhani was out there doing his best to change the perception of the world, he's going to be out there trying to say, uh, you know, this is a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. And you have to be very, very wary of that. He's Do you to, expect him to say that? Yeah, I would, say even, I would say even clearer. I would say that to beware of what he says. It's deeds that are more important than, uh, than words. Right now, we don't see anything in actuality. Do not let up on, on sanctions. Increase sanctions. Force them to act as a result of more increased sanctions, you're in a position of strength right now, not in a position of weakness. Uh, Iran is, is coming uh, to this level of, of amenableness and approachability because the sanctions are so effective. Now's the time to really put the game down, mm -hmm. put them in the position that we want them in, and force them to, uh, to reduce their nuclear weapons agenda. He will use the expression weapons agenda also, almost certainly, as opposed to just nuclear agenda and technology agenda. He was specifically focusing on weaponization issues. We should hear that phrase. Yeah, yes. I would almost certainly suggest that that phrase. Interesting. Be. Okay, Shai, what's your sense? What do you expect the Prime Minister to say? I think he will definitely talk about Iran in the way that Micah described. One, one thing that happened in the last few days is that Argentina announced a deal with Iran on investigating the 1994 bombing of the Anya Center in Buenos Aires, which everybody, including Interpol, has basically concluded was sponsored by Iran. Uh, the fact that the government of Argentina today is willing to launch some joint investigation with the very country that sponsored the bombing is disappointing. Uh, Why would they do it? Why would Argentina do it? Yeah. Politics. Politics in Latin America. Iran has made significant inroads. There's a large Iranian presence now. Uh, there's a large terrorist presence. There's a, also a, quite a Palestinian presence in Latin America. So th th this is going on as well. The fact that Netanyahu has to focus on Iran isn't necessarily going to help in containing Iran or denying its, its, nuclear, uh, its nuclear capability, but 
for the Prime Minister of Israel to come at this time after the Prime Minister, after the president, new president of Iran spoke, after they had the phone call between Obama and Rouhani, uh, for the Prime Minister of Israel not to focus on that would send, would send a signal mm -hmm. that maybe it's okay now. Uh, so the fact that he met yesterday in the White House with President Obama, I'm sure that uh, on the way over, Mike and I were talking about what did they do for four hours. Yes. And one of the things that they might have done, well, I don't, Mike didn't say this, but he may agree, I'm, I'm betting that they, they spent some time rewriting Netanyahu's speech a little bit to reflect, uh, to reflect new, new insights from the, uh, the contacts between Kerry and, and the new foreign minister of Iran and between President Obama and President Rouhani, and, and so that this will really be a very up-to-the-minute speech, I'm hoping. You agree? I agree with uh, much of what was said. There's no question. Shai has uh, insight in, in predicting or, or extrapolating what may have happened in the room. I would say that four hours you have a lot of time to cover and a lot of the material to cover. And rewriting a speech is not necessarily a, a primary objective, but I would say that um, tweeting, uh, tweaking the tweets, because <laughs> we're in the tweeter's world, tweaking those tweets, those, those few words that are essential, I think were important. I think that the United States would have said, you know, please emphasize this, punch these lines. We used to say punch the lines. Now you don't have to. You say, what did you tweet on this? <laughs> and so that's the idea. What did you tweet? So punching lines was important. I think that what they really did in that meeting is they went over strategies and potential outcomes. They talked about Iran, obviously, Syria, Egypt, the Palestinian peace process. They really were sharing the various scenarios that could emerge as a result of it. On the world stage, remember, we constantly, and, and uh, it's a Jewish program, and we're Jews sitting around the table, uh, but we've got to realize that the implication of what's going on in Iran is not a Jewish issue or an Israeli yes, one. Yes, very it's important. very important to realize that. Forgive me for uh, interrupting you. It looks to me like uh, Ambassador Peterson has concluded, and we expect now the Prime Minister of Israel to be introduced, and here he comes. The last time he spoke, of course, he had that very powerful drawing in the red line. We go now to the United Nations and Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Mm -hmm. And I invite him to address the General Assembly. Yeah. Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I feel deeply honored and privileged to stand here before you today representing the citizens of the State of Israel. We are an ancient people. We date back nearly 4,000 years to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We have journeyed through time. We've overcome the greatest of adversities. And we reestablished our sovereign state in our ancestral homeland, the land of Israel. Now, the Jewish people's odyssey through time has taught us two things. Never give up hope always remain vigilant. Hope charts the future. Vigilance protects it. Today, our hope for the future is challenged by a nuclear-armed Iran that seeks our destruction. But I want you to know that wasn't always the case. Some 2,500 years ago, the great Persian King Cyrus ended the Babylonian exile of the Jewish people. He issued a famous edict in which he proclaimed the right of the Jews to return to the land of Israel and rebuild the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. That's a Persian decree. And thus began an historic friendship between the Jews and the Persians that lasted until modern times. But in 1979, a radical regime in Tehran tried to stamp out that friendship. As it was busy crushing the Iranian people's hope for democracy, 
It also led wild chants of death to the Jews. Now, since that time, presidents of Iran have come and gone. Some presidents were considered moderates, others hardliners. But they've all served that same unforgiving creed, that same unforgiving regime. That creed that is espoused and enforced by the real power in Iran, the dictator known as the supreme leader, first Ayatollah Khomeini, and now Ayatollah Khamenei. President Rouhani, like the presidents who came before him, is a loyal servant of the regime. He was one of only six candidates the regime permitted to run for office. See, nearly 700 other candidates were rejected. So what made him acceptable? Well, Rouhani headed Iran's Supreme National Security Council from 1989 through 2003. During that time, Iran's henchmen gunned down opposition leaders in a Berlin restaurant. They murdered 85 people at the Jewish Community Center in Buenos Aires. They killed 19 American soldiers by blowing up the Kobar Towers in Saudi Arabia. Are we to believe that Rouhani, the national security advisor of Iran at the time, knew nothing about these attacks? Of course he did. Just as 30 years ago, Iran's security chiefs knew about the bombings in Beirut that killed 241 American Marines and 58 French paratroopers. Rouhani was also Iran's chief nuclear negotiator between 2003 and 2005. He masterminded the, the strategy which enabled Iran to advance its nuclear weapons program behind a smokescreen of diplomatic engagement and very soothing rhetoric. Now, I know, Bukhani doesn't sound like Ahmadinejad. But when it comes to Iran's nuclear weapons program, the only difference between them is this. Ahmadinejad was a wolf in wolf's clothing. Bukhani is a wolf in sheep's clothing. A wolf who thinks he can pull the eyes, the wool over the eyes of the international community. Well, like everyone else, I wish we could believe Rouhani's words. But we must focus on Iran's actions. And it's the brazen contrast, this extraordinary contradiction between Rouhani's words and Iran's actions, that is so startling. Rouhani stood at this very podium last week and praised Iranian democracy. Iranian democracy, he said. But the regime that he represents executes political dissidents by the hundreds and jails them by the thousands. Rouhani spoke of, quote, the human tragedy in Syria. Yet Iran directly participates in Assad's murder and massacre of tens of thousands of innocent men, women, and children in Syria. And that regime is propping up a Syrian regime that just used chemical weapons against its own people. Rouhani condemned the, quote, violent scourge of terrorism. Yet in the last three years alone, Iran has ordered, planned, or perpetrated terrorist attacks in 25 cities in five continents. Rouhani denounces, quote, attempts to change the re regional balance through proxies. 
Yet Iran is actively destabilizing Lebanon, Yemen, Bahrain, and many other Middle Eastern countries. Wuhani promises, quote, constructive engagement with other countries. Yet two years ago, Iranian agents tried to assassinate Saudi Arabia's ambassador in Washington, D.C. And just three weeks ago, an Iranian agent was arrested trying to collect information for possible attacks against the American embassy in Tel Aviv. Some constructive engagement. I wish I could be moved by Rouhani's invitation to join his wave, a world against violence and extremism. Yet the only waves Iran has generated in the last 30 years are waves of violence and terrorism that it has unleashed in the region and across the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish I could believe Wuhani, but I don't. Because facts are stubborn things. And the facts are that Iran's savage record flatly contradicts Wuhani's soothing rhetoric. Last Friday, Wuhani assured us that in pursuit of its nuclear program, Iran, this is a quote, Iran has never chosen deceit and secrecy. Never chosen deceit and secrecy. Well, in 2002, Iran was caught red-handed, secretly building an underground centrifuge facility in Natanz. And then, in 2009, Iran was again caught red-handed, secretly building a huge underground nuclear facility for uranium enrichment in a mountain near Qom. Wuhani tells us uh, not to worry. He assures us that all of this is not intended for nuclear weapons. Any of you believe that? If you believe that, here's a few questions you might want to ask. Why would a country that claims to only want peaceful nuclear energy, why would such a country build hidden underground enrichment facilities? Why would a country with vast natural energy reserves invest billions in developing nuclear energy? Why would a country intent on merely civilian nuclear programs continue to defy multiple Security Council resolutions and incur the tremendous cost of crippling sanctions on its economy? And why would a country with a peaceful nuclear program develop intercontinental ballistic missiles whose sole purpose is to deliver nuclear warheads? You don't build ICBMs to carry TNT thousands of miles away. You build them for one purpose, to carry nuclear warheads. And Iran is building now ICBMs that the United States says could reach this city in three or four years. Why would they do all this? The answer is simple. Iran is not building a peaceful nuclear program. Iran is developing nuclear weapons. Last year alone, Iran enriched three tons of uranium to three and a half percent doubled its stockpile of 20% enriched uranium, and added thousands of new centrifuges, including advanced centrifuges. It also continued work on the heavy water reactor in Iraq. That's in order to have another route to the bomb, a plutonium path. And since Rouhani's election, and I stress this, this vast and feverish effort 
has continued unabated. Ladies and gentlemen, underground nuclear facilities, heavy water reactors, advanced centrifuges, ICBMs. See, it's not that it's hard to find evidence that Iran has a nuclear program, a nuclear weapons program. It's hard to find evidence that Iran doesn't have a nuclear weapons program. Last year when I uh, spoke here at the UN, I drew a red line. Now Iran has been very careful not to cross that line. But Iran is positioning itself to race across that line in the future at a time of its choosing. Iran wants to be in a position to rush forward to build nuclear bombs before the international community can detect it and much less prevent it. Yet Iran faces one big problem. And that problem can be summed up in one word, sanctions. I've argued for many years, including on this podium, that the only way to peacefully prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons is to combine tough sanctions with a credible military threat. And that policy today is bearing fruit. Thanks to the efforts of many countries, many represented here, and under the leadership of the United States, tough sanctions have taken a big bite off the Iranian economy. Oil revenues have fallen, the currency has plummeted, banks are hard-pressed to transfer money. So as a result, the regime is under intense pressure from the Iranian people to get the sanctions relieved or removed. That's why Rouhani got elected in the first place. That's why he launched his charm offensive. He definitely wants to get the sanctions lifted. I guarantee you that. But he doesn't want to give up Iranians nuclear, Iran's nuclear weapons program in return. Now, here's a strategy to achieve this. First, smile a lot. Smiling never hurts. Second, pay lip service to peace, democracy, and tolerance. Third, offer meaningless concessions in exchange for lifting sanctions. And fourth, and the most important, ensure that Iran retains sufficient nuclear material and sufficient nuclear infrastructure to race to the bomb at a time that it chooses to do so. You know why Rouhani thinks he can get away with this? I mean, this is a ruse. It's a ploy. Why does Rouhani think he can, thinks he can get away with it? Because, because he's gotten away with it before. Because his strategy of talking a lot and doing little has worked for him in the past. He even brags about this. Here's what he said in his 2011 book about his time as Iran's chief nuclear negotiator. And I quote, while we were talking to the Europeans in Tehran, we were installing equipment in Isfahan. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Isfahan facility is an indispensable part of Iran's nuclear weapons program. That's where uranium ore called yellow cake is converted into an enrichable form. Rouhani boasted, and I quote, by creating a calm environment, a calm environment, we were able to complete the work in Isfahan. He fooled the world once. Now he thinks he can fool it again. You see, Rouhani thinks he can have his yellow cake and eat it too. And he has another reason to believe that he can get away with this. 
And that reason is called North Korea. Like Iran, North Korea also said its nuclear program was for peaceful purposes. Like Iran, North Korea also offered meaningless concessions and empty promises in return for sanctions relief. In 2005, North Korea agreed to a deal that was celebrated the world over by many well-meaning people. Here's what the New York Times editorial had to say about it. Quote, for years now, foreign policy insiders have pointed to North Korea as the ultimate nightmare, a closed, hostile, and paranoid dictatorship with an aggressive nuclear weapons program. Very few could envision a successful outcome. And yet North Korea agreed in principle this week to dismantle its nuclear weapons program, return to the NPT, abide by the treaty's safeguards, and admit international inspectors. And finally, diplomacy, it seems, does work after all. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, a year later, North Korea exploded its first nuclear weapons device. Yet, as dangerous as a nuclear arm North Korea is, it pales in comparison to the danger of a nuclear-armed Iran. A nuclear-armed Iran would have a chokehold on the world's main energy supplies. It would tr trigger nuclear proliferation throughout the Middle East, turning the most unstable part of the planet into a nuclear tinderbox. And for the first time in history, it would make the specter of nuclear terrorism a clear and present danger. A nuclear-armed Iran in the Middle East wouldn't be another North Korea. It would be another 50 North Koreas. Now, I know that some in the international community think I'm exagger exaggerating this threat. Sure, they know that Iran's regime leads uh, these chants, death to America, death to Israel, that it pledges to uh, wipe Israel off the map. But they think that this wild rhetoric is just bluster for domestic consumption. Have these people learned nothing from history? The last century has taught us that when a radical regime with global ambitions gets awesome power, sooner or later, its appetite for aggression knows no bounds. That's the central lesson of the 20th century. And we cannot forget it. The world may have forgotten this lesson. The Jewish people have not. Iran's fanaticism is not bluster. It's real. This fanatic regime must never be allowed to arm itself with nuclear weapons. I know that the world is weary of war. We in Israel, we know all too well the cost of war. But history has taught us that to prevent war tomorrow, we must be firm today. Now this raises the question, can diplomacy stop this threat? Well, the only diplomatic solution that would work is one that fully dismantles Iran's nuclear weapons program and prevents it from having one in the future. President Obama rightly said that Iran's conciliatory words must be matched by transparent, verifiable, and meaningful action. And to be meaningful, a diplomatic solution would require Iran to do four things. First, cease all uranium enrichment. This is called for by several Security Council resolutions. Second, remove from Iran's territory the stockpiles of enriched uranium. Third, dismantle the infrastructure for a nuclear breakout capability 
including the underground facility at Qom and the advanced centrifuges in Natanz. And four, stop all work at the heavy water reactor in Iraq aimed at the production of plutonium. These steps would put an end to Iran's nuclear weapons program and eliminate its breakout capability. There are those who would readily agree to leave Iran with a residual capability to enrich uranium. I advise them to pay close attention to what Rouhani said in a speech to Iran's Supreme Cultural Revolution, Supreme Cultural Revolutionary Council. This was published in 2005. I quote, here's what he said. A country that could enrich uranium to about 3.5% will also have the capability to enrich it to about 90%. Having fuel cycle capability virtually means that a country that possesses this capability is able to produce nuclear weapons. Precisely. This is why Iran's nuclear weapons program must be fully and verifiably dismantled. And this is why the pressure on Iran must continue. So here's what the international community must do. First, keep up the sanctions. If Iran advances its nuclear weapons program during negotiations, strengthen the sanctions. Second, don't agree to a partial deal. A partial deal would lift international sanctions that have taken years to put in place in exchange for cosmetic concessions that will take only weeks for Iran to reverse. Third, lift the sanctions only when Iran fully dismantles its nuclear weapons program. My friends, the international community has Iran on the ropes. If you want to knock out Iran's nuclear weapons program peacefully, don't let up the pressure. Keep it up. We all want to give diplomacy with Iran a chance to succeed. But when it comes to Iran, the greater the pressure, the greater the chance. Three decades ago, President Ronald Reagan famously advised, trust but verify. When it comes to Iran's nuclear weapons program, here's my advice. Distrust, dismantle, and verify. Ladies and gentlemen, Israel will never acquiesce to nuclear arms in the hands of a rogue regime that repeatedly promises to wipe us off the map. Against such a threat, Israel will have no choice but to defend itself. I want there to be no confusion on this point. Israel will not allow Iran to get nuclear weapons. If Israel is forced to stand alone, Israel will stand alone. Yet in standing alone, Israel will know that we will be defending many, many others. The dangers of a nuclear-armed Iran and the emergence of other threats in our region have led many of our Arab neighbors to recognize, finally recognize, that Israel is not their enemy. And this affords us the opportunity to overcome historic animosities and build new relationships, new friendships, new hopes. Israel welcomes engagement with the wider Arab world. We hope that our common interests and common challenges will help us forge a more peaceful future. And Israel con continues to seek an historic compromise with our Palestinian neighbors one that ends our conflict once and for all. We want peace based on security and mutual recognition in which a demilitarized Palestinian state recognizes the Jewish state of Israel. 
I remain committed to achieving an historic reconciliation and building a better future for Israelis and Palestinians alike. Now, I have no illusions about how difficult this will be to achieve. Twenty years ago, the peace process between Israel and the Palestinians began. Six Israeli prime ministers, myself included, have not succeeded in achieving peace with the Palestinians. My predecessors were prepared to make painful concessions. So am I. But so far, Palestinian leaders haven't been prepared to offer the painful concessions they must make in order to end the conflict. For peace to be achieved, the Palestinians must finally recognize the Jewish state. And Israel's security needs must be met. I am prepared to make an historic compromise for a genuine and enduring peace. But I will never compromise on the security of my people and of my country, the one and only Jewish state. Ladies and gentlemen, one cold day in the late 19th century, my grandfather, Nathan, and his younger brother, Judah, were standing in a railway station in the heart of Europe. They were seen by a group of anti-Semitic hoodlums who ran towards them waving clubs, screaming, death to the Jews. My grandfather shouted to his younger brother to flee and save himself. And he then stood alone against the raging mob to slow it down. They beat him senseless. They left him for dead. And before he passed out, covered in his own blood, he said to himself, what a disgrace, what a disgrace. The descendants of the Maccabees lie in the mud, powerless to defend themselves. He promised himself then that if he lived, he would take his family to the Jewish homeland and help build a future for the Jewish people. I stand here today as Israel's Prime Minister because my grandfather kept that promise. And so many other Israelis have a similar story, a parent or a grandparent who fled every conceivable oppression and came to Israel to start a new life in our ancient homeland. Together we've transformed a bludgeoned Jewish people left for dead into a vibrant, thriving nation, defending itself with the courage of modern Maccabees, developing limitless possibilities for the future. In our time, the biblical prophecies are being realized. As the prophet Amos said, they shall rebuild ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall till gardens and eat their fruit. And I will plant them upon their soil, never to be uprooted again. Veshavti et shvut ami Yisrael, uvanu arim neshamot vayashavu, ונטו קרמים ושתו את יינם, ועשו גינות ואכלו את פריים, ונתתים על אדמתם, ולא ינטשו עוד. Ladies and gentlemen, the people of Israel have come home never to be uprooted again. The remarks of Benjamin Netanyahu to the 
General Assembly of the United Nations. And you heard the applause On behalf of the General Assembly. at the end of the remark, and it almost sounded like the only ones who were applauding were the delegation from the State of Israel. Um, we're going to, uh, first of all, have some comments from the people who are joining me at this table. And then we're also going to put our phone number up on the phone. We have some people who will be speaking to on the phone as well. Let me introduce the lovely people who have joined me to talk about the reactions they have to the remarks of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. First, joining us now, Rabbi Eric Yaffe, the immediate past president of the Union for Reform Judaism. He now writes for the Huffington Post and for Haaretz. I'm glad you made it through that traffic. Thank you for joining us very, very much. I'm also joined again, as I introduced you before, and again, all these people you well know by now. Micah Halpern, a columnist whom you can read online, his Micah Report, and he's also the author of the best-selling Thugs, which chronicles the actions of some of the world's most heinous despots. And we're joined here in the studio by Shai Franklin, formerly the managing editor of Middle East Insight, currently senior fellow for United Nations Affairs at the Institute on Religion and Public Policy. And again, we invite you to be in touch with us. We're going to put our phone number up on the screen. We're live at the moment here in our Shalom TV studios. I wish if you'd like to comment, what was your reaction to the remarks of Benjamin Netanyahu? Now, uh, Eric, I start with you. You heard his remarks. First of all, <laughs> Did you think he did a good job? He always does a good job. Nobody <laughs> speaks like Benjamin Netanyahu. He's done a great job. But wait, gentlemen, do we all agree he spoke well? Yes. Okay. So now content. Mm -hmm. How did he do? It was a good speech. It was a tough speech. That's what we expect from him. That's his job. <laughs> uh, he was more conciliatory towards the end. Again, appropriate, the right political thing to do. Um, the overall impact and where we go from here, that raises a whole set of other questions. I thought it was a good, strong speech. Did he say anything that bothered you? No. Okay, very, very good. Okay, Micah, you heard him. You had suggested what you might hear, we, what, what we might hear before he began. In terms of what his message was, did it have any surprises for you? What did you take away from it? Uh, no surprises at all. I could have written the speech. I actually predicted the speech, <laughs> even using the terms that he used. Um, even more than that, I would say, uh, uh, he, using the Palestinian issue, which is also very important for him and for the President of the United States, by the way, I'm certain in their four hours of discussion yesterday, the Palestinian issue was also prominent in their dialogue. Um, the open arms to the rest of the uh, Arabic world and Muslim world was also a very important gesture, and one which he sort of said, uh, look, the threat right now is towards Israel, so you think, but it really isn't. When we're threatened and we will act, he's speaking now, it will actually be for the benefit of all the world. And um, he's hinting back to, of course, the, the uh, nuclear development in Iraq, mm -hmm. where it was Israel that was uh, condemned for their action, but in the end made the world a safer place mm -hmm. because of it. So he's, he's really focusing okay. on those issues. Did he say anything that bothered you? Nothing really. I mean, uh, it, it's important that the Prime Minister of Israel stand up and say that once the Jewish people were victims and today they are not. Interesting. And they will not be. And it's interesting also, so he really takes a line from Bialik's very, very famous poem, uh, The City of Slaughter, when he talks about the Maccabees. It wasn't, he just didn't throw it out. It's a powerful, powerful a message that the image of the Jew in the diaspora is the fallen Maccabee and then it's resurrected obviously in the, new, in the new state. So there's a new society that's uh, emerging. I think he not just did a good job, I think he pounded his lines properly, but he didn't overstate it. He, wasn't, he can be extremely rhetorical. He can be remarkably convincing also. He balanced it between that. He was teaching the world a few things during this presentation. All right, it seems to me, Shai, that both Eric and Michael were very impressed by the content and presentation do you agree? I agree. I was impressed. The audience, by the way, the acoustics in the temporary hall, which they're using yes. when they renovate the main UN building, are such that it sounds like a clatter of, of clapping. I'm sure that everybody that was in the room, except maybe the North Koreans, uh, <laughs> <laughs> applauded. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't worry too much about that. However, the hall was emptying out because this was actually the last speech of the entire round of high-level debate to open the UN General Assembly session. Uh, 
he mentioned yellow cake, and he made a nice little joke. The only people who would understand the joke are Americans and Israelis. And any Jew, I guess, would understand it because we were supposed to get jokes. Uh, the fact that he mentioned yellow cake, though, is a, uh, is a throwback to the UN debate over use of force in Iraq, which did not turn out so well. That reminded me that his purpose in speaking today was not to convince world leaders, all of whom are, have left New York. It was not to convince a global audience. It was to convince Israelis and American Jews and Christians, because he referred to biblical prophecy, the fulfillment of biblical prophecy, which, which really is very important for the Christian base of pro-Israel support in America. And the fact that he quoted at the end from, from the Tanakh, from the Bible, and he did not translate it, was, was, was clearly very specific. Mm -hmm. uh, it was specifically designed to show Israelis at home that he is addressing them and that he is standing up for them. And when he talked about pain, taking f painful concessions, part of his delegation sitting there included Zev Elkin, who's the deputy foreign minister. You remember, the, there is no foreign minister. The, the foreign minister in waiting is, is, uh, is under indictment, on trial. So the top foreign ministry official sitting there has said continuously and repeatedly that Israel, under this prime minister, will not make the painful concessions that Netanyahu says they might be willing to make. Under no circumstances will we give up settlements, any settlements. That's what he said. He was sitting right there. Excuse me. It's interesting. The Israeli press said that Elkin was not going to be included in the delegation, but he was there. He was there. Okay. Interesting. Very and he was in yesterday's meeting with the, with the president also. All right, very, very good. Um, by the way, I am thrilled that some of you have already called. Miriam's waiting for us. Miriam, just be patient. In one moment, I'm going to come to you. And we have some other callers on the line. All of you will get a chance to speak with Eric, Micah, and with Shai and me. So please be patient. We'll get right to you. I just want to ask one more question of our group before we go to the phones. I was wondering myself, and you sort of addressed this now, Shai, whom was Netanyahu speaking to? Who was his audience, and did, was he successful? Eric, whom was he speaking to, and was he successful? I think he was speaking primarily to the Americans. Those are the only to allies. To the Americans. The Americans, American Jews to some extent, more broadly the American public and the American political class. Those are the only people who are really important um, in terms of his calculations. Was he successful with them? And the answer is I'm not at all sure. Uh, Americans aren't listening to this. Americans have other things on their mind now. The timing is terrible. By it's, coincidence. Uh, is, is terrible by coincidence. Uh, CNN poll, by the way, just came out saying how many Americans approve of the diplomatic talks between America and Iran. 75% approved. That's a very, very high number. Does it trouble you? Um, per se, no, but a broader trend toward isolationism and withdrawal from the world, which is what is happening now in a dramatic way, much more so than I would have predicted even six months ago. That's part of the picture here. We yes. have something to worry about in that regard. I think he was talking to them how, how much impact he made. There I really don't know. Micah? Yeah, I have to disagree with the direction of the um, or orientation of the speech itself. I think that there were several uh, important constituencies. The most important was Iran. Um, the second, you think he was talking to Iran? Yeah, I think he spoke a certain element of the speech was directed towards Iran and to say, look, uh, um, we are creating a, a bulwark against you, and I'm a part of that bulwark. I'm not independent. Israel's not independent. We're a part of it. They're not just defending Israel. We're defending the world. The world is a part of a bulwark against you. And, and when you, uh, it was a 32-minute speech. Of the 32 minutes, I would say at least 26 were dedicated to Iran. And that, that's an important element to, to focus on. I think when you look at the United Nations General Assembly in general, there are a lot of speeches. People don't pay a lot of attention to it. A lot of, media, a lot of stuff takes place outside the general hall. And those halls are important discussions and dialogues. The reality is that uh, uh, putting it on paper, recording it, having a document that says this will be referred to. Mm -hmm. A handful of people refer to it otherwise. People aren't watching it on live. I mean, we're the equivalent now of a, of a C-SPAN discussion, on, and, and it's important. Right here on Shalom right, TV. Right now. That's exactly. correct. And so that kind of C-SPAN approach is a sliver of people that, for whom it's very important mm -hmm. and it's uh, valuable. That said, um, it's important to set the tone it diplomatically. It creates a record also. Right. And the record, it's, it's down on record, exactly. and can be referred to, and it's a diplomatic 
um, stimulus. The United States now sees that uh, Netanyahu said A, B, C, and D after they had a major discussion with him, and the, uh, and the momentum can be placed and people can stand up in their lines based on that. Okay. You raise so many interesting questions. I want to deal with all of them. I want to get to Miriam. Let me ask you one quick question. Eric says he's worried about a growing sense of isolationism. Do you agree that that is the mood of the country today? I, I think there's always been a, you know, Netanyahu talked about 2,500 years ago. Let's talk about 250 years. There's always been a, a strong isolationist current in America and in American politics, whether it's Republicans or Democrats. And now the fact that Americans support U.S. engagement with Iran, on the one hand, should be reassuring because we're engaging. On the other hand, it's because we don't want to expend resources and assets abroad. So, so we are sort of, it's, 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 it's some Amer you have to wonder why do certain Americans support negotiating with Iran or having conversations with Iran, and why do others support it? There are different reasons that are behind it. And, and I think that what's significant about Netanyahu's speech is he did not say, don't engage Iran. Engage Iran, but make sure that the sanctions continue. Rabin said, we will fight terrorism like there's no peace process and, fight, and, and, and make peace like there's, no, like there's no terrorism. I might have gotten the order wrong. Oh, we understand. Uh, Netanyahu is making the same kind of thing, and I think Obama gave him the same pledge yesterday. Okay. That was a play, by the way, on, on, on Ben Gurion's comment on the Nazis. Which is probably play on. Having to do with the British. British. Oh, no. Okay, um, Miriam, we're going to come to you. We're, we have a caller from Miriam who, who calls us from Brooklyn. Miriam, are you there? I am. I'm right here. Miriam, and it's I lovely. Ha first of all, it's lovely having you. You watch Shalom TV. I do, and we met at the parade this year. That's lovely. <laughs> Share your thoughts with our panel. Okay. First, I found his words very stirring, and I want to say that it's very easy to want to hide under the skirts of denial. I want to. I think <laughs> everyone wants to. However. If we, the world, does not heed this very harsh warning, I believe it will be condemned to suffer the horror of the reality of nuclear war. And I think that because Israel is so close to the center of this issue, they are forced to react and to have issue with it now. Miriam, I, I thank you. I dread yeah. what would happen if those nuclear warheads were used. I understand. It is wonderful to have you as our first caller. Watch all the time, okay, Miriam? Thank you, darling. Uh, any reaction? Basically, what she's saying is... You can't disagree with that. Yes, I mean, <laughs> yes, right. You can't disagree with that. You can't disagree that it's a potential threat, and the threat is enormous, and the risks are even greater. So, and Israel is... Um, I need to know that. Now, recognize also the president, and uh, again, <coughs> I hate to be put in a position where I'm defending a particular politician. <laughs> the president, and even Susan Rice's national security advisor on, on Friday and then Saturday, came up very clearly, and yesterday, uh, President Obama said also, just because we're engaging doesn't necessarily mean we're trustful and that we actually realize the dangers there. Um, it doesn't mean that we're suddenly friends with. Uh, the Saudis, by the way, are not happy with this engagement, you should know. Forget about the Israeli scene. The Saudis are potentially okay. very I upset. would love to know, though, what the three of you feel about the fact that we now have a diplomatic initiative between President Obama and Rouhani. And, Again, there was no phone call between presidents of Iran and the United States since 1979 with the Islamic Revolution. And the question is, is it the right thing to be doing? And, you know, it's easy to say, of course, we support diplomacy. The question is, do you, tr do you at the moment, do any of the three of you literally trust that Rouhani is in some way opening up a diplomatic initiative that is honest? Eric? I thought the Prime Minister put this rather well. He's doing it because he's under pressure. Mm -hmm. He's doing it because the sanctions are working. Uh, again, much more effective than five or seven years ago I would have imagined possible. Me too. You have a new government. You have people who are suffering. You have the Ayatollahs who are wondering about their own future. You have the need for some kind of movement and some kind of action. That's what brought him to the table. That's good. The possibility of a diplomatic resolution of that is good. 
Having said that, there are many, many dangers in this process, and there's some things in the world that have shifted against Israel's interests in terms of American sentiment that I talked about, in terms of um, you know, the, the broader climate, relations with Europe, and so on. There are a lot of dangers in this process. Basically, though, we welcome the diplomatic initiative. We hope for success, uh, and everybody needs to be very careful along the way. Do you trust it? I don't trust it at all. But then again, we play right into their hand. Uh, an example, for months, the United States was trying to create some sort of a meeting in, uh, in New York between the two. For months. Remember, there were missives that were going back. There were letters that were going. For months, they tried to do it. And it can happen in a private area. It can happen as they pass a room. I've been in rooms where, where, uh, where uh, leaders actually met one another accidentally. Uh, and, but it takes a long time to put those accidents together. But that's not the case. Uh, Rouhani did not want to meet. We were afraid of a picture. It's important also because there's this uh, uh, issue about the handshaking. And Americans really don't understand the Islamic world. Handshaking is really not an Islamic phenomenon. Actually, so much so that it is really the history of handshakes are, are very uh, Greek and Roman. One extends the right hand because it's your, your weapon hand. So you extend it to say that it is without a weapon. Uh, so it's actually pagan to the Iranian, which is very, very important. And in certain elements of Shia, to touch, not a woman, to touch a, a non-believer requires uh, purification. So we don't uh, extend our hands that way. And there are many places, and it's not a man-woman thing. This is really, you don't shake hands. So to push the ha shaking of hands was just a mistake. Um, and by the Obama administration. By the Obama administration. They even have this myth that one shakes hands and makes up. It's a cultural anomaly. It's sort of a synapse. It doesn't work in that part of the world. And so to emphasize it and to push it and to talk about it and write about it, which is people just weren't understanding mm -hmm. what was going on, that was deeply problematic. Okay, but bottom line for you is you don't trust. I don't trust them at all. Shai, do you trust? I don't trust that Iran is stopping its uranium enrichment while these negotiations go on. I do trust that there's more to it than just black and white. Netanyahu was, was being rhetorical. It's a speech, after all. He's trying to make a point. But there, there are all different kinds of, of streams. Even within the, the, the regime under Ayatollah Khamenei, that there are different, different flows and different, different factions. I, I've been saying for several years that if anybody other than Ahmadinejad had been president during these past eight years, chances are Iran would have a nuclear device by now. It's because of the optics of Ahmadinejad, openly denying the Holocaust, threatening Israel, uh, you know, capturing British sailors, all these things, that it made it very easy to deny him uh, any, kind of, any kind of conciliation. And now with Rouhani, there's an opening not just on the nuclear issues and not specifically on Israel's concerns about the nuclear issues, on a whole range of issues. Regional, Syria, of course, uh, terrorism. Uh, there's stuff going back... We have four decades of baggage with, with Iran that, that we need to start addressing. And now we can hopefully deal with Syria a little bit, which interestingly enough, Netanyahu didn't mention even in one Not way. at all. We're going to take a moment to go to a caller, and then we're going to continue our discussion. We're going to go to Connecticut, where Peter is on the phone. Peter, are you there? Yes, I am. Okay. What's your comment? Well, my comment is this. Uh, my comment is this. Yes, I am. Go ahead. Turn your TV uh, my, down. My comment is this. <laughs> yep. uh, the world apparently uh, needs to continue to learn that when a despot, when a despot speaks, when a despot speaks, you better listen and listen carefully. They cannot be negotiated with, and we've learned that through the ages. The uh, concern I have here what seems to come out very clearly from Netanyahu is that he's not concerned about the United States watch, having watched to watch Israel's back. Uh, Netanyahu came out and made it very clear that they're not looking to the United States to watching its back, but is prepared to take action on its own. And it was very clear that through the history of the Jewish people that the time has come for the world to understand that Israel is prepared to stand on its own. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, react to that, please. One of the things that was so striking to me at the end, toward the end of his remarks, he went out of his way to say Israel will not permit 
Iran to get a nuclear weapon, and if they have to go it alone, they're going to go it alone. Eric, what's, what do you make of all that? I don't think that's very credible. I think if you spend three days reading Israeli papers, all of the papers across the political spectrum, and what, what the experts have to say, it's very hard to find somebody in Israel who believes that that's actually going to happen. That it's capable of happening, right? First of all, that it's capable in the early stages of this discussion, vers virtually every military expert who could speak, which means those who are retired, because currently in the military you can't address these issues, virtually everyone, wherever they were on the political spectrum, warned against it. Uh, some seeming to suggest that they simply were not capable of doing it on a sustained basis over the course of weeks, and others pointing out the, you know, the political dangers. Um, and there was, uh, you know, the notion that the, the prime minister would go ahead and order such an attack uh, in the face of what seems to be a broad consensus in Israel, uh, that Israel does, does not have the capability, it would be a political mistake to do so. I mean, all of that seems to me So this was all unlikely. rhetoric? All rhetoric? I think he felt an obligation to say it for reasons that we can understand. He had to say, if nothing else happens, don't count us out. Uh, do I think Israelis believe it? Uh, you know, honestly, I don't. Uh, do I think the Americans believe it? Honestly, I don't. I think they see that as a very, very minimal and distant possibility. Interesting. Either of you disagree? Several years ago here in New York, during this week of the opening, or last week of the opening UN General Assembly, uh, I was in one of these Jewish meetings with a visiting uh, foreign leader, European leader, and we asked him about Iran. And he said when he came in to meet Ayatollah Khamenei in Tehran, Khamenei was sitting there stirring his tea, and he didn't even look up. The European leader said, Mr. Supreme Leader, you, you seem very in, engrossed in something. What, what is on your mind? And he looked up and he said, I'm, I'm considering how to destroy the state of Israel. <laughs> it's just, there's that stream. I don't know how in, that in, relates to what Eric well, is saying. But there's that stream, but there's also a stream which says, you know what? Iran isn't looking to take over the world. Iran isn't looking to destroy Israel. This is within Iran. There are many Iranians. I'm not saying Rouhani is one of them. There are many Iranians who, maybe because of the sanctions that they brought upon themselves, feel very vulnerable, maybe because of Iraq, which we supported for many years during the Iran-Iraq war. They feel very vulnerable. And when, when Netanyahu closes his speech out by saying, we will stand alone, we will make sure that Iran has no nuclear program at all, because when he says absolute, I think he used the word absolute, absolutely get rid of the entire nuclear weapons program. Well, the thing with nuclear weapons is, until you actually weaponize it, there is no nuclear weapons program. It's the nuclear program. He's saying, we will get rid of your nuclear, your nuclear program. We will get rid of your national pride. From a, an Iranian perspective, now, it is, we feel good. We feel proud that he said that. But in terms of actually having an impact on Iranian thinking, I don't think this is going to help what Obama's trying to do. What I, Obama's trying what to do? What Obama's trying to do by engaging Iran. It, it might make Obama look more credible, but I, I think it's going, to, it's going to hurt Rouhani back at home. Will that hurt us? Will that help us? I don't know. But within inter internal Iranian I'm, politics, okay, it, I, it, it, it I, makes My problem is I didn't follow the train of thought. Eric made a point that even though Netanyahu talked about Israel going it alone, it's not credible. It's not most of the experts of a military nature in Israel don't believe Israel has the capability of doing it, and that it was a rhetorical statement more than anything else. I wanted to know from you whether you agree Israel is not about to go oh, it alone. I, I, I agree on that, but, but the impact of what he said, he's basically saying, he, he even mentioned Reagan, he's saying, I'm the cowboy, I have a gun, and I'm going to use it. So and you're critical of him for that. I, I, I'm not critical, I, I think maybe he had to say that, but it will have an impact on the ground in Iran. Yep. An impact for good or an impact for bad? I'm not sure. You're not sure. I'm so not it sure. could be for good. It, it could be, but it will have an impact. It, the only way, and there, there are reasons why he says things, both for rhetoric and reality, the only way that sanctions work, the only way that diplomacy can work is if there is a potentially active loaded gun. And if it's not active, and if it's not on what we would call a hair trigger, and that's what the United States is constantly dangling in front of others, Israel's on a hair trigger, we're just holding them back. If that's not there, then the threat, the potential threat of a military strike uh, doesn't exist. And so from the, uh, from the theoretical point of view and the diplomatic point of view, it's enormously important to set that in motion, even if it might not necessarily be as effective as uh, Eric is suggesting. On the other hand... Doesn't it have to be an American gun? Uh, no, it ha uh, no, it has to be at least supported by and sponsored by and helped by and assisted by 
the United States. Also, a gun and doesn't have to be a, a gun. A, no, 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 wait, exactly. no, 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 no. He was not talking about that. He's, he's he was about, talking about taking a military yeah. action to eliminate Iran's nuclear program if sanctions don't work and no one else is willing but to do it. But there's another element here that I want to extend, and, and uh, it's not that I'm disagreeing with you. I'm suggesting that there's a disagree larger... With no, I, but if I would, it would be respectfully. So uh, I'm, I'm adding... I'm always feeling, respectful. I'm adding, I'm adding to, the, uh, to, your, uh, to your image if I can. And what the addition that was important here is that um, the United States has one idea of a strike. Israel has potentially other ideas of strikes. And just because you're, uh, you uh, think that the objective is to ruin the entire nuclear program, where you talk about that, doesn't necessarily mean that Israel's objective might not be a surgical strike at a particular place, at a particular time, at a particular moment. One, which two, you three, think Israel which is not does a have the capability of doing. Absolutely. Which do you is think, not a Eric, do you which disagree? Is not a sustained strike. They could do just it a minute, get, just a minute. Eric, do you disagree? I'm no military expert yet, but yes, I do disagree. I mean, I can expand on that a little bit. Go ahead. I've read all the ports again. I, br I bring no military ba background to this. But first of all, the preponderance of opinion. I heard a very careful analysis by an American who had served in the higher levels of the administration dealing with this, uh, completely off the record. He said, look, we feel that it would take three weeks of continual bombing we Americans could do that off carriers, and we have the capacity to do it. America does. America has the capacity to do it. Um, but first of all, Israel does not have that capacity. And second of all, look at the political picture. There would be resolutions in front of the Security Council after day one. America could hold them off till day three. Would America hold them off for the second or third week as the Israeli strikes continued? Would a pinpoint strike make a difference? Again, as a non-military expert, based on everything I've read, no, I don't think so. So um, I, I, I don't see that as an option for Israel, and I think what's important is to keep the option alive for America. I thought Netanyahu, for America, for America, I thought the prime minister was successful yesterday in his meeting with Obama because the first time in weeks he said all options are on the table. He hadn't said that recently, so. Uh, Meaning that's President an, Obama said President that. President Obama said it, and it was very important uh, uh, for him uh, to do so. Okay, I want you both to understand. What I hear Eric saying is that although there is a rhetoric that Israel would never allow Iran to get a nuclear weapon, what Eric is saying is that American Jews should understand that is basically a rhetorical line and that there is no possibility of Israel ever going it alone. And that's what I'm asking you to comment on. Do you think that, in essence, that is the situation? That we're not likely ever to see Israel have the capability, maybe even make the decision, to go against Iran's nuclear program alone? Um, I would say that I would hope that that would not be the case. I'm sorry? But I would hope that Israel not do it alone. Mm -hmm. I would hope that, effectively, there would be much more... Um, uh, uh, appropriate and, uh, and targeted with the assistance of the United States. Israel would prefer that the United States and the other allies do it instead of them. But I'm also absolutely 100% convinced from my analysis and my understanding that if the point, that red line does exist, and if it is crossed, Israel will strike. Will they wipe it out? They are not capable of wiping it out. They were, they were what I call a knockdown punch, not a knockout punch. There's a big difference. Okay, so the we United have a real States disagreement a between the right. two of you. So we have, the United States has That's a knockout okay. punch. Yeah. Uh, Israel has a knockdown punch. Remember also, Israel's purpose is not necessarily to knock out, even though that's what we heard. The objective is to set back the time and the clock sometimes. And you could do that. Uh, you could do it in numerous ways. Israel has the bunker buster bombs. They don't have enough of them. They certainly don't want to use all of their weapons against Iran when you have a whole series of other fronts that are going to be needing those soon. Uh, that said, Israel would absolutely prefer that the United States handle this. But over the last three or four months, and certainly the last uh, year and a half, Israel has learned also that the United States isn't as quick to make the decisions. That is correct. Uh, and so as a result, they've changed their operational status with regard to these questions uh, within the last few weeks. Even. Okay. Can I just say uh, one thing? Uh, quick, because I want to go to France. Israel has, made, has appropriately made a strong case against Iran for a number of years. And the sanctions regime and, and Israel's position in the world, uh, its credibility, is, is, will, will significantly be set back if it strikes Iran. If it strikes Iran and it can't completely take out the nuclear program, then it won't be able to stop the next round. Mm -hmm. 
We go to our phones again. Fran calling from Rockland County. Fran, are you there? Yes, I am. I've been waiting patiently. You've been wonderful. Um, I appreciate the patience. I appreciate you watch Shalom TV. What are your I reactions? I watch it all the time. I enjoy it very much. Thank you. Um, I thought his speech was very strong to the point. There was two items that really got to me, and the story about his grandfather, yes. which was really everyone's story, Yes. every Jew's story. And this, the, his ending was, was just perfect. We have a home, and we're never going to leave it. And, I, and it really got to me. I brought tears to my eyes. I appreciate Those are my comments. That was wonderful, Fran. Fran, what is your own background? Where are your parents my, from? My parents came from Poland. And then I was born in Russia, in Georgia. We went to a DP camp, displaced persons in yes. Germany. Yes. And then we came here. We were supposed to go to Israel, but then they found some family. And it's a whole long story. We came here. I was seven years old then. Well, it is lovely to have you as one of our family, and I appreciate your calling I very, am. very much. Yes. Thank you, dear. Thank you. I want to take another call right away. We're going to Yaakov. I don't know where Yaakov's calling from, Dar. Where's Yaakov? Yaakov in Rockland from County Rockland also. County. How are you, Yaakov? Very well. One of your uh, major points was the fact that uh, uh, Netanyahu was addressing the American people. I'd like to know what you and your panel think about uh, this problem. When the average American looks on the college campus and he sees the vociferous anti-Israel stance by so many leftist Jewish students, I want to know, does the Jewish establishment in America bear any responsibility for this? And if so, what are they going to do about it? Because it's destroying the public relations of, of Israel in this country. Thank you for the question, Yaakov. I'll be anxious to hear what our panel has to say. Eric, you're part of the Jew. You were part of the Jewish <laughs> establishment. Yeah, no more. <laughs> um, well, look, I'm not, I'm not sure that that's directly connected with the, the Prime Minister's Correct. talk. Correct, right. Uh, but uh, anti-Semitism is a problem everywhere. I think, generally speaking, it's a problem on campus, absolutely. I think sometimes... It can be exaggerated. In other words, I've been, I traveled to campuses, and I was there one this week. In some cases, I find, first of all, there's not always anti-Semitism. In some cases, Jewish groups are very effective I agree. In, in responding to it. By and large, the American Jewish community, we have a lot of failures. And as a rabbi, we have many failures in the religious realm. I could talk about that for a long time. Uh, in responding to anti-Semitism, I think we've done a very good job. We have to continue to be vigilant. We have much to do. Um, but the, the Jewish establishment in the Jewish organizational world is aware and uh, on top of this issue, I think, to a very substantial degree. And you, don't, you have no criticism at the moment for the way this issue has been handled by the Jewish, quote, establishment, namely that there are certain college campuses which do have a strong anti-Israel bias. Look, I think it happens in certain places. It tends to happen in, uh, uh, very often in places where the, the Jewish organizational presence is not strong, uh, where the Arab presence is strong. There are a whole variety of reasons for it. We have, again, I repeat, done a fairly effective job in locating trouble spots and responding, I think, uh, effectively. That, that would be my position. What would you say to Yaakov? I'm a former student activist. From yes, the 80s, you are. When the, the, the campus really seemed like a battleground. But you know, when I got down to Washington, or I got to New York, or I went overseas, I found out that all, the, all these important battles that I'd fought on campus, the, the fact is, to, to our caller, the good news is the average American is not watching the college campus. Uh, maybe that's bad news, maybe that's good news. <laughs> uh, and I, I think that we also, we do ourselves a disservice both rhetorically and strategically by, by drawing a, a, a boundary around certain arguments and characterizing those as anti-Israel. Uh, I, I don't support boycotting the settlements in the West Bank. But if somebody says, if a, if a Jewish student says, I want to boycott settlements in the West Bank, that student doesn't, isn't necessarily being anti-Israel. That can feed into anti-Israel and even anti-Semitic uh, tropes and, and campaigns. But the people, for example, this week meeting in Washington for the J Street conference, they may not support the IDF. They may not see a military solution. But that doesn't make them anti-Israel. And if we define them as anti-Israel, then we may be cutting off a significant part of our future. There is, on college campus, however, a significant far-left position, often articulated by student bodies, that is anti-Israel. Yes. Okay. 
What would you say to Yaakov? Well, actually, there was an element of his question that you began to answer just now as you posed it, uh, the clarification of the shy. And I was, I was surprised that Eric didn't deal with it because he really did say, as posed by left-wing Jewish student groups. So he's suggesting that there's an internal um, uh, subterfuge which is taking place, which I think is very interesting to focus on also. Look, I think that anti-Semitism is not on the rise. I think that it is, by and large, uh, the Jewish life today pales in comparison to what it was 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and certainly in, my, in our parents' and grandparents' lives. And to uh, present it as such is, uh, is a misunderstanding of the anti-Semitism that, that our parents and grandparents live through. Does the um, phenomenon bother you? It does b bother me. What bothers me is that um, people couch their uh, their anti-Semitism in a dispute with Israel, mm -hmm. that they hide their hatred of Jews in their politically correct, their politically correct critique of Israel. That disturbs me a lot. And that's an issue of rhetoric, but it's also an issue of, of design. By the way, that's exactly what Rouhani did also. Rouhani is a Holocaust denier, but chose not to deny it the way others It was all style. So he called the Holocaust a massacre. A massacre takes place once. It doesn't take place over years. He said, oh, the historians will ferret out the truth of what really happened. There's no better uh, documented genocide in history than the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. It's not to be decided by right. historians. Uh, he uses these terms, which are great to be couched in university terminology, which is why he's got a PhD uh, from a university in Glasgow. Uh, you know, so he understands these issues. That troubles me on campus, that we can couch our hatred of the Jews in a politically correct method, mm -hmm. and even some Jews join the bandwagon on that, and that's deeply troubling. The reality, though, is I want to make certain that the love of Israel has equal footing and a stance on these campuses, and it's not put down just because uh, people love Israel. Yaakov, I appreciate the call very, very much. We're going to go right now to another call. This time we've made the call to someone you've heard often on Shalom TV. He is the Washington Bureau Chief of the JTA, the Jewish Telegraphic Agency, Ron Kempius. Ron, thank you for joining us, and I'd love to, you're on, by the way, with Eric Yaffe, Micah Halpern, and Shai Franklin. What was your reaction to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's remarks today? I, I think uh, the most significant thing was that he, he made explicit the warning that if needs be, Israel will strike Iran on its own. Oh, oh and by the way, thank you for having me. You're welcome. Um, Love having you. Um, uh, yeah, I think that was the, 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 you know, the most significant thing, and not just in itself that he's making this explicit warning. But it comes a day after he goes to the White House and he's seeking insurances that the United States will maintain a credible military threat against Iran. And I'm sure, you know, he got some assurances. I'm, I'm sure that, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I mean, I'm fairly confident that Obama said, no, we're not. We're good. I mean, we know that Obama said uh, uh, that, he's, um, uh, that he's maintaining the military option. But the assurances, like, clearly were not sufficient for Netanyahu, for him to make that explicit warning. You, so Ron, Ron, so, sorry, thing. Ron, you feel that Netanyahu's reference and the way he, not only was reference, it was a very strong statement, was in some way a reaction to what he did not get from Obama in the meeting yesterday? Yeah, I think so. I don't think that he would go, uh, you know, I think he, he constructed, he had a very strong speech constructed around the, no, the, the notion that, uh, you know, as he put it, instead of trust and verify, distrust, dismantle and verify. And that's like, that's been his principal message until now. Uh, I think that uh, throwing that in, that very strong warning in, it was a, uh, was a sign that he, um, he doesn't think that, uh, that, the, the, that Obama, that the West is, is ready to go far enough in terms of stopping Iran. Okay, I'd love you to, <coughs> to dialogue for a moment with people of our panel. Um, do any of you want to, in any way, take issue with what Ron has suggested? Uh, Mike? Yeah, I don't think, uh, I, I don't think we can <coughs> tell from the tone or from the, we weren't flies on the wall, so that's for sure. That said, uh, the Prime Minister had to get things on the record in front of the United Nations, and he said things that were on the agenda, uh, on his agenda. Uh, I don't think that we can interpret from that such a <coughs> major statement 
that was changed as a result of his meeting yesterday with uh, the president. I don't think that at all. If anything, I would say that the tone seemed to be much better coming out of the White House and the, uh, and the Prime Minister's team uh, yesterday than it had been in, in the past. Yeah, it was interesting, Ron, before you came on, <coughs> the sense that some of the panelists were describing here was that the speech reflected a positive relationship that developed during the four-hour conversation between Netanyahu and Obama, and that, in essence, he was given permission to say certain things rather than having to, having to in essence, challenge Obama in the speech. Now, you seem to see it differently, yes? Yeah, I, but, but I, yeah, that, that, that's, uh, that's also, now, now that I hear that, that's, a, that's, a, that's an interesting perspective, that, uh, uh, you know, in the sense that... Um, that the United States and, and Israel have always played good cop, bad cop with with Iran, and um, you know that there's a uh, uh, that this, this speech, Netanyahu's speech, could be seen as a warning, uh, not just from Israel but from the United States, from the Obama administration to Iran that uh, that uh, this is how far it could go if things uh, if things don't advance well in terms of the, of the diplomacy in terms of the outrage. I want to sneak in one more question before I lose you. There was a debate here about whether Israel does or does not have the military capability to really launch an effective strike against Iran's nuclear weapons program. And Eric specifically was the most vocal in saying that everything he's learned from the discussions he's had, it does not seem like Israel has a credible way of ending nuclear, the, Iran's nuclear program on its own. It could do so perhaps with the United States, but not on its own. From the people you speak with all the time, Ron, what's your sense of how Israelis view the realistic possibility of Israel launching its own independent, isolated nuclear um, military strike against Iran's nuclear capability? You know, uh, I, have, I, I haven't heard anything very recently, but what I've heard consistently heard is that Israel could inflict some damage and, and maybe not enough that Iran back uh, sufficiently uh, that, uh, that, you, you're, that you, you need the, um, yeah, the U.S. Uh, to be part of any, of any action to inflict uh, uh, effective damage, for sure. Mm -hmm. Shah, you have a comment for yeah, well, First of all, Ron, uh, Ron has been a distinguished journalist for many years. Now he is a distinguished American journalist, so congratulations, Ron. <laughs> uh, and as a distinguished American journalist, you were at the White House yesterday on the sidelines of these meetings. Is there anything you can share with us, uh, maybe that didn't make it into your, uh, your final edit at JTA, that something you might have heard on the sidelines about, that, about whether it's Netanyahu's speech or something that came out of the meetings in terms of Iran-U.S. or maybe Syria, which Netanyahu didn't address in his speech? Uh, you know, the only thing I, I can tell you is what I've heard before leading up to uh, yesterday's meeting, which is that there's like a, a concern that um, that there's there, there's a that the United States might not uh, that but they have, there's a concern over what would constitute a credible military threat, and uh, at one point the United States would carry it out. I think that the you know, in one sense, like uh, I, I talk to people about the I mean, speaking of Syria about the whole reaction to the whole. Uh, chemical weapons brouhaha. We have like a forest and trees difference on it between Israel and here. Here, we see the back and forth. We we perceive uh, President Obama as equivocating. He wants a strike. That he wants Congress to authorize a strike. Then he takes a strike off the table. The Israelis have a different way of interpreting that, and they've actually were encouraged by it to a degree in the in in the sense that they saw uh, Obama make a credible threat for a strike, and then they saw the Syrians suddenly change their tune, acknowledge that they do have chemical weapons. And enter a process by which uh, you know they're they are supposed to divest themselves of the chemical weapons. So that certainly occurred, encouraged the Israelis regarding um, regarding the whole Iran equation, but it, it encouraged them only to a degree. There, I don't I don't think I don't sense from the Israelis that they're absolutely certain that uh, that uh, President Obama would go the, the whole nine yards. Uh, and the other thing, I mean, just from being in the room, if you want, the, the one thing I did see is that the, the body language was excellent, uh, at least much better than it was during that their famous uh, meeting in uh, the spring of 2011 after uh, President Obama envisioned a peace based on 1967 lines. Netanyahu, who was turning towards Obama, he was watching him intently and, and smiling. Uh, you know, they, they seem a lot more relaxed with one another. Sure. Eric, any other comment you have for Ron? Look, I, I just, um, I think Israel's in a very vulnerable position right now. 
And I, I think that's the underlying uh, reality. On the one hand, Obama might emerge, looking back in history, as the great hero here who resolved the Syrian issue uh, of chemical weapons and resolved the Iranian threat. On the other hand, he kind of stumbled into this. <laughs> and uh, so Israelis are hopeful, but also cautious and worried. And as I said, the political realities here have changed dramatically. I mean, uh, uh, Israel used to assume that in Congress there was this hard right wing uh, uh, group that could always be uh, uh, counted on to support Israel no matter what and to back military action and so on. That's changed in a dramatic way. I mean, uh, when, when the president called on Congress for support on the, the chemical weapons, what happened? And who was on the other side? I mean, you had people on the left, but you also had all the people on the right who are generally speaking uh, seen as being in the, in the hardline camp. So all of that together, I think, creates a difficult, worrisome situation and a need for very sophisticated uh, diplomacy. By and large, I think the prime minister has done well up to now. Of course, we haven't even talked about the Palestinian issue, which is a factor in this broader picture, given the potential political weakness of, of uh, Israel. So it, it's, um, I, th I think we need to be careful now. We have to be cautious. We have to recognize the dangers. Ron, any closing comment? No, yeah, I, I'd absolutely agree with the, with, with the last speaker. It's a definitely, uh, it's a change, it's not just a changed Congress, it's a changed political landscape. I think that, you know, you've got a class of, uh, like he's talking about the, the right wing in the, in the Congress, you've got a class of Republicans uh, that, you know, in one sense are intuitively pro-Israel, but on the other hand are not familiar with a lot of how uh, the mechanisms of pro-Israel works in the U.S. government. And, and you've also got, uh, I think, a, um, a, a Congress in general that's very wary of any military engagement in the, uh, in the Middle East because of the, uh, what, what the Iraq and the Afghanistan wars took out of the American body politics. Ron, as always, I appreciate you taking the time to join the discussion. We will turn to you often. All my best. Thank you. Thank you. So, lo and behold, Ron and Eric just referred to the vulnerability of Israel and where is, how do Israelis feel about this. One of the things we'd like to do is actually bring in Izzy Liebler from Israel, Jerusalem right now, and Izzy's going to give us some of his reaction to the speech of uh, Benjamin Netanyahu and maybe dialogue with our panel. Izzy, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Mark. Izzy, did you hear the remarks of Prime Minister Netanyahu? Yes, I did. What was your reaction? Well, as expected, with his golden tongue, it was a tour de force, and I was very proud as an Israeli and as a Jew to listen to, listen to him saying the things that he did, and there's no doubt we could not have a better representative uh, than Netanyahu to speak on such occasions. The question of the impact is a different matter. Unfortunately... I got the feeling that a lot of the people there simply don't want to listen because they're in a, how would I put it, a peace in our time mood and they're desperate to find an accommodation. Even that means burying their heads in the sand and ignoring it. I think the important thing about Bibi is he proved very clearly that those people who were accusing him of being a spoiler, that he was anything but a spoiler. All he did was... He said, negotiations, yes, but take into account the duplicitous record of Rouhani and his bosses. And he gave an analogy with North Korea about playing for time, which I think is the key factor in all of this that worries him. It's clear, he said, that Israel will act if necessary. And, of course, he stymied in that respect. He can't do anything while the U.S., his allies, engage in negotiations. I have to ask myself, Obama said very nice things to him before the speech. I'd like to say I believe him, but I don't think too many people believe that he meant it, and I hope that we're all wrong. On the other hand, there is that remote possibility that he will act and not want to make a fool of himself again, and if he does act on this issue, the people who will be the happiest that, that the diplomatic area has proved results will be the Israelis. They are, after all, on the front lines and the last people who want to see military action, but will do what is necessary to secure their survival. I think that kind of sums it up. Izzy, 
do Israelis in general have faith that now Rouhani is initiating a new era of Iranian diplomacy? Absolutely not. They look at this man's record, and they remember that in 2003 to 2005, this man was saying exactly the same thing, and a year later was boasting about how he lied and cheated and managed to put people off looking at their, at their nuclear development programs. Why should we believe him now? He certainly is suave, and we all miss Ahmadinejad because Ahmadinejad spoke as a real raving anti-Semite, and he puts on a very nice facade but bottom line, I want to see the proof. If there is really a proof that he means it, then let's see it. I don't believe it. My real concern is time. And if he's going to drag this on for months, it'll be catastrophic because in the meantime, the centrifuges are spinning and they're moving on their, on, on, on their atomic bomb. One more thing, Izzy, here at the table, we've discussed the sort of the last end of the speech by Netanyahu in which he, number one, made it clear that from his perspective, Israel would take unilateral action of a military nature against Iran to stop its nuclear program. And then he referred to the Maccabees, and he talked about his grandfather in a very moving way, and we've had callers who've referred to that part of the speech. Here at the table, there's been a discussion about whether Netanyahu had to say that, both for domestic consumption and maybe even for American Jewish, the American Jewish people, but that there is a harsh reality of a military nature, and maybe Israel doesn't have the ability, and therefore would not make a calculated error, to take military action against Iran alone. From your own perspective, as you, again, talk to people in Israel, and you speak to military people all the time as well, to what extent was that part of, of uh, Netanyahu's speech, as dramatic as it may have been, more rhetoric than substance? Look, it's very difficult not having any access to Israeli intelligence, uh, which is the right thing for a person like myself not to have. Uh, it's very difficult for me to make a, a, a statement. All I do know is that he has been doing this now for two or three years, and the world will one day credit him for being the one responsible for having ensured that this stayed on the agenda. I just hope that he sees it through. If they can, they will. And I must say, uh, I don't know what was said at your table beforehand, but as a Jew and as an Israeli, I felt very proud that he put this in a historical perspective because that's what we're all about, the Jewish state is a state built on history and on Jewish tradition. And he pointed out that there is a connection with the Maccabees, and he also pointed out the terrible plight of Jews until the Jewish state was established. And that's something that I think, even if the rest of the world doesn't fully appreciate it, it was very important for us to say it to ourselves. And I do think that many friendly non-Jews will certainly appreciate it and, and identify with it. So I say bravo to him. Okay. Don't leave, Izzy. I want to see if any of our panelists have anything to say either to you or about some of the things you've said. Eric? We have Eric Yaffe, Micah Halpern, and Shai Franklin here. Eric? I agree with what he said. Okay. Micah? Well, I think, that, I think we have to push the element of the strike a little bit more if we could. And I think it's important. I'd like to... Um, the reality is that uh, when we talk about Israel acting alone, it isn't really actually Israel acting alone. Because Israel can't fly or send things in that direction without the flight codes, to be specific. Um, what happens is when you're looking at the analysis of attack, uh, when you're checking out what's happening in the air, they're either friends or foes. If you, let, if you don't have the right codes in your system, you're seen automatically on the computer as an enemy. So the United States has to give Israel those codes in order to fly. Otherwise, they will be targeted by American defenses in the area, and that's very, very important. So the, they need to work together with the United States, even if they act predominantly alone. Now we're talking about the operational issue, and I think it's important to state. Okay. And that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they get, well, there's a green light, the red light, yellow light. Is, unless there's a real rupture, I don't see President Obama, uh, if things break down, standing in the way of Israel and not cooperating, because there is an American public opinion they may be against a war, but they're also against a nuclear bomb. And I don't think 
uh, that they would stand in the way of Israel, uh, and that I believe they would even help Israel but, if that if it came to that. I, mean, I would like to believe that because without that, I agree we can't do it. We can't act totally alone. A country of eight million can't just run this by itself. Let's put aside the strategic questions and so on, with which I may agree. The idea that public opinion stands behind an American role in an attack on Iran, I think it's contrary to everything we see, all the evidence that we have, all the polls that we read, all the political developments in, in, in Congress. Yes, the point that had been made, Izzy, is that it seems that Americans as a whole are more and more sort of inward isolationist. There seems to be this overwhelming hope that the new diplomacy between Obama and the new, it's called new, the new Iranian regime will bear fruit. 75% of the American people support this new diplomacy. And so one of the things we've heard at this table is that this may create difficulties in uh, gaining or generating American support, especially in Congress, for an Israeli strike. But Shai Franklin, you wanted to say? You know, I, 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 I read you, Izzy Liebler. I literally read you. And, uh, we all read you, Izzy. And sometimes it can be quite depressing to read you <laughs> when it refers to U.S. Israel relations. The fact that you're now saying this uh, doesn't mean it's all a rosy picture. But it means that, that I, I, I take what you say on this with, with a little more credibility than maybe from somebody like myself, <laughs> who tends to paint more of a rosy picture. Uh, and, and I think, you know, in, in 1967, I don't have a direct recollection of this, but uh, in 1967, we were, we were, you know, bogged down in Vietnam. And yet the United States still basically allowed Israel to do what it did. What Michael, Michael was talking about was basically, you know, allowing Israel to do what it, what it might do. And, and that is different than saying we're going to commit serious assets. We're going to you know, give basing and, and uh, air support and in-flight in refueling or whatever else it might take. Providing some intelligence, providing these, these, these codes, th that is something that the United States could do. And I think many Americans would be okay with it. I, I think and I think that's all that Israel would expect of them under those circumstances. They're not expecting Americans to invade uh, uh, Iran. I think that there's an element which is important also theoretically to understand this in the dialogue, and it's a, a terminology that we have to use and we use actually in our analysis. There's a green light, red light, yellow light phenomenon. And um, there are times that the United States has given Israel green light and Israel has not acted, uh, and very specific green lights. There are times when there's been yellow lights and there are times when there were red lights. There is right now a red light. And in that way, I absolutely 100% agree with Eric's presentation on this. There have been times where there are yellow lights, and then the tension emerges, by the way, between um, the United States and Israel when that yellow light, Israel's trying to, to move within the green, so to speak. And there are times when there are green lights when Israel wasn't ready. It wasn't ready because they weren't strategically ready, but they weren't certain that their action would be effective. Remember, I spoke about the concept of a knockdown, not a knockout punch. And we've got to recognize the distinction. Knockdown punch is not a knockout punch. But you so, feel right now it's a red light for Israel. It is absolutely. Uh, look, we don't, know, absolutely. we don't know that. We don't have sufficient intelligence. There's also the American relationship which Israel has taken into account, more so, I think, strangely enough, with Bibi and Obama, despite all the tensions they've had. Uh, it's been taken into account more than in predecessors because, I mean, uh, even Olmert didn't, uh, I mean, he was told, Olmert was told not to bomb the Syrians. He, he bombed them, despite Bush's request that they don't bomb them. I mean, Bibi has been extraordinarily careful not to break that relationship. And I, I think that there is an understanding, and he's sending a message here, that come what may, if this breaks down, we do expect you to stand by. And I think America will stand by within the terms that you've been uh, stating just beforehand. All right, one more question for you, Izzy, then I'll let you go. And then I want to hear what our panel also has to say on the same question. And I'm now expressing my own perspective. I, I have a feeling, my own feeling is, that there is something naive in the way in which the administration has embraced this new Iranian regime. In reality, I do not hear anything different being said by the current president of Iran that Ahmadinejad did not say. He always said, he, he always said, we have no nuclear plans to build a bomb, and there's no reason for the United States to be angry with us, and uh, basically you won't talk to us, 
but we're going to come to the United States, and that we felt here in the United States that he was, that his own rhetoric was such, as Shai said earlier, it was nice to have somebody who was so black and white about it. And he didn't come and smile, as Netanyahu said, and he didn't seem to say the right things. But the bottom line for me is that there's nothing new here. I don't see anything new here. Nothing new here. Except a well, different you're, agree oh. you're in agreement with our Prime Minister and the vast majority of the people here. We're just hoping that when they start with negotiations, a miracle can happen. But uh, it's an extraordinarily remote possibility, and I believe that we're facing a very, very difficult period uh, if the world is just going to uh, turn around and, and do a peace in our time operation in relation to this, because the stakes are very, very high. And I'm not sure that uh, Bibi was uh, kind of just making noises. I think he's sending a message to the United States that we have no choice. If this breaks down and if they go ahead with an atomic bomb, we're going to have to intervene. Izzy, I appreciate your comments so much. Thank you for giving us some time. We'll call you often. All the very best. Thank you. Bye. In essence, what Izzy Lieber said is really how I look at it. And I want to know whether you feel I am being too pessimistic and that there, again, everybody wants negotiations. I'm not you're, saying You're being politically naive. I'm being naive. <laughs> yes. I'm being naive. You're being naive. I, I want it to go on record that I'm Lachayim. <laughs> One of my guests called me politically naive. In go ahead. Words, we Jews, because we're so deeply and profoundly committed to Israel, um, sometimes we create a little world for ourselves and we focus only on our, our, our needs and our desires and our sense of justice. And, and that's appropriate. And in a sense, I, I applaud that. But what I'm suggesting to you, we're part of a broader world, and we're not always sufficiently aware of what's happening in that, in, in that broader world. What is different now? Not that the Iranians have changed a tune. Uh, and we all agree on that. This guy's a charlatan. But what's different now is, first of all, as I said before, the sanctions clearly are working. They've been effective. They've been in place a long time. The economy there is collapsing. That's one new reality. And the second new reality, as I've said now many times, is a change in political climate here that makes the president a bit more anxious, desperate even, uh, to turn to the diplomatic route. A year ago, Rand Paul was a wacko bird, to quote Senator McCain. Six months ago, nobody thought that he would be a serious presidential candidate. Today, there's a sense that, that uh, in the Republican primaries, he will probably be a first-tier candidate. R Marco Rubio, who had Tea Party support and certainly a right-wing senator, but at the same time was always seen as more reasonable, comes from Florida, a lot of Jews there. When, when the uh, Syrian issue came, uh, uh, to the, uh, the fore, and there was the question of responding to chemical weapons, Senator Rubio said, oh no, the Americans can't do that. And then he tripped all over himself in a very, you know, very interesting way to explain that, well, this was, of course, different from Iran and so on and so forth. Those are very sobering developments to me, very troublesome developments to me. And the notion that the Prime Minister of Israel is just going to go ahead because it's the right thing to do, it may be the right thing to do, but in this new political reality, we're all going to have to be a lot more careful, a lot more cautious than we've been in the past. Okay, I appreciate it, but I don't hear where I was naive. My own comment was, I don't take anything that's being done now or said. By Iran. By Iran. He hasn't changed, but the political world has changed around us, and therefore a new reality has been created. That will what? That will, that will allow the President of the United States to negotiate with the president of Iran for some kind of end to the nuclear weapons program in Iran? Well, Is that what you're suggesting? It, it makes, on the one hand, somewhat more likely because Iran, in fact, wants and needs a, a deal, and the president is anxious to have one himself. At the same time, I want to recognize uh, President Obama seemed weak and stumbling and getting to the point where he is now. So he has simultaneously, in the eyes of, of uh, countries in the region, perhaps the Iranians themselves, been weakened. That's the tension that we are now uh, dealing with. And uh, Israel is caught in the middle of that. 
The well, bottom line for Israel, however, always is, in my opinion, always is. It has one reliable ally, one country that can count on for support. It has to maintain good relations uh, with the United States, no matter what, because absent that, they are lost. Okay. We are lost. Nothing you've said do I disagree with, although I still don't understand. Okay, then I, maybe I withdraw the naive comment. <laughs> okay, but it's my, very uh, good. Oh, my, 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 <laughs> concern, my concern is so simple. My concern is that in the climate that you described from the very beginning of your comments, where mm -hmm. there is now a move towards isolationism, that they, we have now a president who had a terrible time with Syrian, the whole Syrian issue. It seems to me that it is possible that the United States would grab on any possibility of not having to be confrontational, to somehow hope that this negotiations, this diplomacy now, will in fact be efficacious towards one end, ending Iran's nuclear weapons program. And my own sense is, I don't see anything in anything that I've heard or seen done by Iran that would suggest to me the kind of optimism that Obama now expresses. And what well, wait a minute, he, what, what, he what optimism? He, I had a quote from him, and maybe I'll find it in a moment. But um, Obama said that basically he felt that Rouhani's position now opened the door for real diplomatic resolution to the nuclear weapons issue. I don't, feel, I don't find anything credible to, subst to substantiate that kind of position that Obama is taking. And what worries me is a door opens for the United States to go through, which would basically end what Netanyahu was screaming for, keep the foot on the pedal of the sanctions, don't relax on sanctions, and don't ever take the military option off the table. It seems to me that at the moment, the context of the administration and of, of Obama's position is, maybe, there, maybe we have succeeded, we have a new regime now in Iran, and we can take a different tact. If we, I don't, if we I don't see if anything. If we withdraw on sanctions, it's a disaster. It's an absolute, utter, and complete They've already disaster. Begun. They've lifted sanctions on athletes and they've lifted sanctions on uh, academic and, and um, intellectual things. That's they've already stage. begun. And it it's is, but it's an important to, thing. Well, it's important because it sets a tone in terms of the direction of how the administration is going to use the carrot more than the stick, that it, that it is much more enticing. You see, they've done something already. Now let's begin the process. It, and that's where, that's where there might be more tension between Israel and the United States than we may have seen because of that particular issue. The reason, the reason sanctions have been effective is because they've been through the Security Council. The Russians and the Chinese and, and other members, and the members of the General yeah. Assembly, uh, the Europeans, Obama convinced the Europeans that we are willing to negotiate with Iran, and these sanctions are to get them to the table. Forget the optics. Iran says Khamenei has taken a strategic decision. We will now engage. Mm -hmm. For the United States to say, we're not going to engage you, the whole sanctions regime falls apart. Right. And, they have to. You know, and there's something else. We shouldn't just look at what happened in Syria in terms of whether Iran sees a credible threat from the United States. Foreign leaders want to know not just what is the president of the United States doing in their part of the world. They want to know how is the president of the United States doing at home. When they see the president go eyeball to eyeball with the Speaker of the House and with people like Ted Cruz, and when they see McCain jumping on board the president's bandwagon and saying, look, I, I disagree with Obamacare, but it's time to move on. The president, despite the fact that we have this shutdown, the president is, the optics are the president is winning that fight. He's not willing to negotiate with the Republicans over Obamacare in order to keep the government open. They see that and they think, oh, you know what? This guy could be a tough negotiator. In the Islamic world and in the Arabic press, uh, so both in the Iranian press and the Arabic press in general, over the last week, we've seen that the uh, president was seen as begging Rouhani to have a dialogue, begging to come and speak, and literally got him as he was leaving. And it was Rouhani who deigned to speak to him at the end, who actually, uh, actually shaped the discussion and the dialogue, and who actually delivered the insight as to what happened. Rouhani tweeted it from the airport on his way. 
So after the discussion ended, there was no release from the White House as to what happened. But literally almost a blow by blow came from Twitter, from Rouhani's account as to what transpired. I, I think the Arab world is deeply distraught about what's happening. I think they're unhappy with the Americans. I don't think they're looking upon the Americans now here as a tower of strength. Uh, most of our allies are Sunni countries. Um, they're anti-Iran. They're anti-Shia. They've been pushing f for a tough American action uh, uh, against Iran. In fact, they've been pushing, in my view, for a strike probably more than anybody else, uh, even maybe more than the Israelis in some ways. But if you look at the Saudis and you look at the Turks and you look at the Egyptians and you look at the Jordanians, these are all Sunni groups uh, that are anti-Iran and want a strong American hand. I think they're very distraught now and they're worried that uh, Obama is going to give away uh, too much. And, uh, but I would say, with all of that, I don't think Obama can afford to let uh, the Iranians make a fool of him. Mm -hmm. I think he's aware of that. And again, for the political reasons that I've stated, I think now he's the tough guy on the block. That, uh, you know, for partisan purposes, they'll be happy to hit him over the head about <laughs> Iran. <laughs> But given what's happening in the other party, I think he's the tough guy on the block, and we had better hope that when push comes to shove, he will be there. And certainly, you're absolutely right on, on, on sanctions. Put aside a strike. If there's weakness on sanctions, that would be a disaster, because then I really think that all is lost. Then the Iranians simply go ahead, because they, they know that they've won the battle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, Eric has a, a very important point with regard to the concept of sanctions. I'm just worried that my understanding of the history of the way in which um, this administration has dealt with conflict is that they like to praise and they like to reward. And so the question is, is the change in tone that came out of Iran so far with Rouhani, which you don't accept as a change in policy mm -hmm. or a change in action, but a change of tone. And I've actually couched it as just a different way of denying the Holocaust. I want that to be clear. Just a more subtle and more insidious way of denying the Holocaust. That, is that enough to reward him? And if they're rewarding him, remember, he came to power in Iran saying, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to change the image of Iran in the world. We're not going to be seen as a pariah anymore, which clearly he's on the uh, on the path of doing, and I'm going to eliminate, get those sanctions dropped. Those are my two most mm -hmm. important foreign policy issues. He's thought a lot about it, and he's perceive, proceeding in a way which I think is enormously effective. I know that the administration knows this also. The question is, can they break, can they put the brakes on their desire to reward people for good behavior? Should he be rewarded? No, <laughs> but that's <laughs> not my point. It's not my, my, I'm dealing with my analysis, not my opinion. My analysis says, I'm afraid that that is a trap that Iran has set. Mm -hmm. And I know that there are enormous... Remember, the game of chess was created in Persia. This is not a new game for them. They're thinking far down the path in terms of move against move and counter move. We in the United States think that every game is rocky. One punch puts the whole thing out. It's not the case. Yeah. It's a major discussion. And they're looking for a very, very sophisticated analysis here. Since Micah introduced the Hollywood analogy, I'll use <laughs> the, the Indiana Jones, uh, the first Indiana Jones film in the, in the Sook in Cairo, right? Yeah, this, yeah. this assassin comes up and he's got this, uh, this knife and he's doing all this fancy stuff. Very famous. And everybody's very impressed. And Indiana Jones takes out his, uh, takes out his gun and then shoots the guy. Uh, you know, we, we, can, we can focus, we can take satisfaction from proving that, that Iran is still denying the Holocaust. But is that our goal? With Iran, our goal with Iran is to make sure they do not get nuclear weapons. And I think that's Obama's goal as well. If, if we say, oh, we want, they don't want them to cross this line or that line, that's, that's more rhetoric. How far is Obama willing to go to make sure Iran does not get the bomb? Isn't that the ultimate question? I think he's willing to go as far as possible. But we also have to recognize, just in the world of reality, as as necessary. It, you know what? I think we need to do everything we can. But... We, everything that we can do may not be enough mm -hmm. to stop Iran. That doesn't mean we give up. We just have to recognize that not everything, is in the, not everything that happens in the world, especially after the last 10, 15 years in, in Iraq and in Afghanistan and at the Security Council, not everything that happens in the world is completely under the control of Israel and the United States. They had to rewrite that scene in, uh, in Indiana Jones. Really? Because Harrison Ford, it had to be rewritten. Harrison Ford had terrible shilshul. He had terrible diarrhea. And they couldn't complete the scene. So they rewrote it, probably making one of the funniest scenes in 
in that kind of uh, film history to just end it quickly by taking out his weapon and killing Too much information. Yes, I much too much. <laughs> All right, I want to squeeze in, I want to squeeze in another call before the show. I needed to add before that. Before we have to I close. I Harrison Ford isn't watching. <laughs> We're going to go to Farmingdale and welcome Georgine. Thank you for joining us, Georgine. Yes, I've been watching. <laughs> Please, dear. Yes, hello. Hi. Yes, I've been watching uh, Shalom TV, and um, even though I'm a Christian, I'm a member of uh, Kufi. Kufi? Yeah, uh, Christians United for Israel. I yes. went to Washington, D.C., and I uh, spoke to my congressman, uh, Peter King. Yes, Kufi. Yes. And what's your comment? Uh, yes. Uh, not to um, trust the... Um, Iranians, because I've, I've also studied um, the um, philosophy and how they operate just uh, with the deception. So that's what I would tell you to be wary of, is that um, they're taking a page out of North Korea, I believe, to stall. Maybe the sanctions are hurting, but still I think their goal is to get an atomic bomb. And I think you um, underestimate the will of the Americans on Israel. There is a strong support, and I still think in Congress as well. Thank you very much, Georgine. Oh, you're welcome. We have time for one more call. We're going to go out of Pennsylvania. Dana is joining us. Dana, welcome. Thank you. What's your comment, Dana? My comment is Someone in Pennsylvania, at least one person is listening. I, I saw the speech. <laughs> Very good. And I loved it. Very and, good. Uh, I just recently discovered this channel. Do you like it? I love the show on TV. I like all, all, just about all the programs you have on it. Thank you. And, Dana, uh, when, you heard the, when you heard Prime Minister Netanyahu, did Yes, it, I did. I was watching it. Did you like what he and had I to say? And I agree with a, a thousand percent. Okay. And I say that if I have any say in the matter, you won't give up one inch of territory. Dana, I appreciate the call until, very, very until, much. At least until you get some word from them that they will finally recognize your ability, your uh, right to exist. Thank you so much. Keep watching Shalom TV. We really have only a couple minutes left, so I have to limit you to 30 seconds. Give me a 30-second closing comment on your reaction to the entire event today. I think it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a piece of a, a, I don't want to call it theater to dismiss it, but it was theater. The last week, week and a half has been theater, uh, optics, and now we'll, we'll see what, what, what goes forward. They're going, to sit on the, they're going to sit down in Geneva in the next couple of months to talk about Syria, another opportunity for the U.S. and Iran possibly to engage, uh, what role is Israel going to play in all of that, and then uh, we'll, we'll see what, what happens with any other negotiations. Thank you. Micah? Yeah, I think that uh, what it really was was getting things on the record, I think was cementing uh, already existing important relationships, making sure that things are going well. I think there were good, important working meetings that took place in Washington, which really dealt with, with potential future issues and dangers, and I like to see that. I think that Israel and the United States are working very closely together at the highest possible levels. I like to see that also. And the reality is that um, you know, there's nothing wrong with a great speech that takes place, and that exactly. that's also gives a little pride to, uh, to people that fight for freedom and, and justice in the world. Thank you. Eric, wrap it up. The Prime Minister mentioned the Palestinians at the end. It was wise to do so. It was important to do so. I just want to throw out there, we haven't discussed it, but that's what's coming up soon. Both the Americans and the Europeans have expectations in this area. It will be part of their approach to the sanctions questions. We shouldn't delude ourselves. And so we have to, the Israelis most of all, but all of us have to start thinking about how Palestinian negotiations are going to be wrapped into the overall picture. I can't thank the three of you enough. It is always wonderful. I always learn from you. And the fact that you make an effort to be sitting at this table for the Shalom TV audience is both very, very kind of you. You're three of the best in the world. Thank you very, very much. Good to be with you. Pleasure. Really a pleasure. As far as our audience is concerned, thank you for calling. All the callers can't uh, thank you enough. We thank Ron Campius and Izzy Liebler also for joining the discussion. And again, we hope you appreciate this special live presentation on Shalom TV. This is the only place on American television where you could both see the address of, President, of the Prime Minister Netanyahu and then hear the kind of analysis you've heard at this table. And we hope you appreciate it. We appreciate you enormously. My thanks to all the people who helped behind the scenes, to Dara Golub who produced this edition of In the News, to us. Serge Goldberg and to Sloan Copeland for all the technical and for Carol Lilienthal for helping produce the program. 
All of the people who are behind the scenes that you don't get to see, they love what they do here because we feel we're doing something important for the Jewish community. I have to remind you, Shalom TV is a non prop We're just like a Jewish PBS. That means we rely on you for support. If you enjoy what we do for you, if you enjoy the programming and feel we do a public service, I hope from now, from now on and every now and then you will take some time and help support our efforts to, pre to present to you the most significant Jewish television presence, perhaps, in the world. Until the next time, I'm Mark Golub. Be well, my friends. Thank you.